thank you all for coming to the special seminar on Zika virus. I will be the moderator, and our first speaker will be Dr. Mark Schleiss, who many of you know because he sometimes comes to micro rounds. He's the American Legion Professor of Pediatrics and Pediatric Infectious Diseases and is the division director. Mark has an illustrious history studying CMV, including a CMV model in the guinea pig. So naturally, he's very interested, as we all are, on Zika virus. And so uh, Mark will speak first. We're recording all of this. And then when Dr. Osterholm gets here, he'll have his 20 minutes as well. I think we'll take a few questions after Dr. Schleiss has spoken, and then Dr. Osterholm will speak, and then we can have a sparring contest, and anyone in the audience can speak or ask questions. So, Mark, again, many thanks for coming. I know you have to fly to Washington today for study section. Thanks very much, Pat, and thanks for the invitation. One of the fun things, I guess, if there is anything fun about Zika virus, which <coughs> it's horrible infection, as we'll talk about, um, but there are really very few, if any, experts on this, and so I can stand up here and claim to be just as much as an e of an expert as anyone, I suppose. Um, but I will talk to you a little bit about the history of Zika virus, the epidemiology. We'll talk a little bit about clinical manifestations, uh, molecular virology, and then I'm going to hand the podium over to Mike, as Pat indicated, uh, to talk a little bit about public health implications, disease control, and vector control. So the story begins back in 1957, and, uh, 47, excuse me, and you can see here in this map of Africa the country Uganda. This is where Zika virus was first identified. Of course, uh, 1947 was an important year. That was the year Queen Elizabeth got married. It was the year Jackie Robinson uh, started his career with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And here in the Zika forest of Uganda, and you'll note that it's actually spelled Z-I-I-K-A, not Z-I-K-A, um, there was uh, uh, an outbreak of uh, disease first starting in a monkey. Uh, and here on the map you can see where the Zika forest is. It's near the uh, capital. Uh, it, it was in a very densely wooded area at one time, although current indications are that this is becoming pretty well developed in Uganda, as you can see from this contemporary picture showing paved roads coming through. But researchers that were researching yellow fever identified a rhesus macaque that was ill, ran a fever of almost 40 degrees centigrade. This monkey was a part of a uh, study looking for yellow fever virus, was living on a, on a platform in a tree canopy. They took a blood sample from this animal and injected it into the brains of Swiss albino mice, and the mice showed signs of sickness. A filterable transmissible, transmissible agent was isolated from these brains uh, using the nomenclature and parlance of the times, and this, in fact, was the first isol isolation of Zika virus. Uh, in a remarkable experiment uh, published a few years later by William Bearcroft, these mouse brain homogenates were used to inoculate a person, a volunteer, um, who then went on to develop a febrile ailment, as you can see from uh, the slide, this individual developed fever and um, other signs and symptoms of illness. And so um, this uh, was the first isolation of Zika virus infection in a human. The subject in this case was actually Dr. Bearcroft himself. I'm not sure that IRBs or human subjects committees would allow this sort of experiment to take place today. Uh, after those early reports of Zika infection in humans, there were just sporadic case reports over the next 20 or 30 years. A case here, a case there, occasional isolations of the virus from febrile children, a 10-year-old who had fever, headache, and myalgia, uh, and then as serologic assays became available, evidenced by serologic studies of infection working its way through other regions of Africa, uh, and then uh, to uh, the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia through the 1970s and 1990s. Zika really hit prime time, though, in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, published in 2007. And this was a Zika virus outbreak on uh, Iap Island in the Federated States of Micronesia. And as you can see from the map, uh, this island is uh, several hundred kilometers north of, of New Guinea. Uh, this in infection uh, involved uh, up to three-fourths of the population of the island. The other interesting aspect of this illness was that there were no indigenous macaques 
or other monkeys on this island. And so uh, the idea that this was transmitted from a, another primate um, was, was clearly not tenable. Uh, there were 49 confirmed cases, uh, uh, 59 probable cases, and almost 1,000 suspect cases. No deaths, no hospitalizations, and no complications. And this monograph or this table from the New England Journal paper shows some of the signs and symptoms that were identified, which most of us now are familiar with, rash, fever, arthralgia, uh, and conjunctivitis, headache, retroorbital pain, uh, and edema. Zika virus uh, then made its way into French Polynesia. And you can see where these islands are situated here in the Pacific. And so we can begin to see the, the sense of a virus migrating uh, to the east. Uh, French Polynesian outbreak was a very serious outbreak. Uh, there were um, uh, several thousand cases in French Polynesia. Remarkably, this outbreak is not yet published in any detail in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, but these are uh, downloaded images from the uh, uh, government um, agencies in French Polynesia showing this outbreak uh, in 2013. And the other thing I wanted to point out in this uh, slide, in this outbreak, was now for the first time this very striking association with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so you can see in this graph uh, uh, the uh, identification uh, of, of uh, uh, I think, nearly 100 cases of suspect Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, in this French Polynesian outbreak. No reports yet of any congenital infection, uh, fetal anomalies, microcephaly, or other uh, uh, complications of pregnancy. Uh, and just as mysteriously as this outbreak began, it disappeared, and there haven't really been any major reports since then. But just a year later, in Easter Island, uh, which, uh, as you can see from this map, is very, very far east now, still several thousand kilometers from the coast of Chile, uh, but there was an outbreak of Zika virus infection reported here. And this particular outbreak um, was uh, associated again with cl classic signs and symptoms, fever, myalgia, conjunctivitis, rash, and other uh, classical presentations. Uh, the authors in this mon monograph that was published in Archives of Virology 2016 uh, was uh, the authors reported um, also a lot of clinical overlap between dengue fever and chikungunya virus as well. So out of this work to date has emerged now several interesting papers that I just wanted to call your attention to. This one in particular, um, Andrew Haddow, who was actually one of the first uh, discoverers of Zika back in the 1940s and 50s, and then a more con uh, contemporary senior author on this paper, Scott Weaver, um, have genetically characterized these isolates to try to get their arms around what uh, uh, the source of this virus appears to be. And in fact, there are two clades of Zika virus, uh, a clade that is an Asian clade that appears to be the one uh, that we have, have now seen in Brazil. Uh, it's believed that this particular clade descended from the African clade. Uh, and interestingly, there is uh, already some uh, suggestion of important genetic differences between these viruses uh, in possible pathogenesis determinants. And so one of uh, uh, the issues uh, that has come up is the absence of this N-linked glycosylation site in the African clades. Now, the sequence of the original Ugandan isolate from 1947 uh, has, is uh, tempered by the knowledge that it's been passaged through mouse brains. And so that serial passage uh, of, a, of what is not a primary isolate but a subcultured isolate may be selecting for, for non-wild type sequences. We don't know yet. And I think that this is an important question as we think about the pathogenesis of Zika and what the molecular determinants of pathogenesis might be, and I'll come back to that question in a few minutes. A another excellent paper that just was uh, recently published now uh, in Bloss Neglected Tropical Diseases. I don't think that this uh, will qualify much longer as a neglected tropical disease, uh, but that was the journal that this manuscript came uh, up in recently, has mapped the migration of Zika virus from that original Ugandan isolate using sequence from other primary isolates. And there appear to be two major migrations, one toward uh, West Africa and then another one toward Southern Africa. And based on sequence analyses, it appears that the Southern African isolate then made its way uh, to the far east to Malaysia, 
uh, uh, ultimately Yap Island and East, Easter Island. Initially, there was some speculation that these African isolates were introduced to Brazil during the World Cup two, two years ago. But in fact, that does not appear to be the case based, based on molecular phylogenetic analyses. Uh, indeed, what we've seen emerge in South America appears to be the South uh, uh, Pacific strain. And this, again, just sort of maps um, the, the history of Zika virus spread and how it spread from Africa. Again, working its way with sporadic cases in Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, the major Yap Island outbreak in 2007, the, East, the French Polynesian outbreak in 2013, not on the slide, but also important in the sequence, the Easter Island outbreak, and then uh, beginning in 2014 and 2015 cases in Brazil. So this is current data from the CDC for uh, prevention uh, uh, and travel alerts for pregnant women in 24 countries that uh, currently have active transmission of Zika virus. And you can see from the slide that this involves really a, a major uh, uh, component now of, of Latin America and a very important public health issue. The transmission of the virus is via uh, the Aedes mosquito. Uh, primary hosts appear to be monkeys and humans. An unresolved question is whether or not there's any other vertebrate or mammalian carrier or host. Uh, and in fact, most evidence now would suggest that there isn't. And that makes this virus rather different than West Nile virus and other viruses that do circulate through other vertebrate species. Uh, and an important point that I want to raise is the issue of non-vector transmission. And so a case in Colorado in 2008 uh, described a scientist who transmitted the virus to his wife through sexual contact. Uh, this uh, uh, is timely insofar as the CDC issued an alert just yesterday about 14 cases of sexually transmitted Zika virus infection uh, that are currently undergoing investigation in the United States. And so if this emerges as an important route of transmission beyond just the known transmission via the mosquito, then this will really be a remarkable um, uh, uh, change in the epidemiology uh, or our thinking about the epidemiology of this infection. And uh, Mike Osterholm may have some additional comments on, on that point. Uh, mother to child transmission, uh, we'll talk about it in a little more detail. Uh, the safety of the blood supply, a uh, very major issue with Zika virus transmission. And several blood banks in the United States have already, uh, based on FDA recommendations, suggested a deferral of donation uh, of at least 28 days if you've been traveling in a, a Zika endemic area. And as this rush now to develop rapid molecular diagnostics uh, is, is, is taking place, I think it'll be very soon that we'll see uh, testing uh, of, of uh, donated blood for Zika virus. And then another an unanswered question is natal transmission. Uh, Zika virus can be found in urine, uh, semen, prostatic secretions. It can be found in breast milk. Uh, we don't know if there's any transmission from mother to infant by lactation. Uh, by analogy with human cytomegalovirus, we know that that's indeed the most common way in which human beings acquire CMV infection is through best feeding. But in normal healthy term babies, it's of no diagnostic significance. Uh, but this is an unchartered area that needs further investigation as well. This is the non-vector borne uh, transmission case that I told you about. Uh, and it was interesting in this particular um, subject, uh, you can see the classic rash of Zika. And here's a reminder of the signs and symptoms that are associated with primary Zika virus infection, conjunctivitis fever, headache, retroorbital pain, rash, joint pain, uh, this individual had the, the, the very characteristic rash. And in this particular case, uh, uh, the individual who um, transmitted the infection to his wife um, also had signs and symptoms of prostatitis and genital urinary tract uh, symptoms. And so again, underscoring the importance potentially of sexual transmission uh, in the Zika virus epidemic. Uh, the, there are a wide variety of mosquitoes that have actually been described as being potential vectors for Zika uh, beyond just Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Last week uh, at uh, uh, the Institute of Medicine, uh, there was a symposium on Zika, uh, which I participated in. And there was some discussion about whether other mosquito vectors might transmit the infection. Right now, most uh, believe no, even though it's theoretically possible that other mosquitoes may carry the virus, these are unlikely to emerge as major routes of transmission. But clearly, these two strains of um, uh, mosquito are key, and it's very relevant in 
insofar as Aedes albopictus is now uh, endemic in many parts of the, of the United States, as you can see from this slide. And so I think an important point um, that's going to emerge is what can we expect in North America, especially with the summer months coming? And I think um, Mike has some comments on that during his remarks. The diagnosis of Zika in the American tropics is, of course, complicated because these mosquitoes also spread dengue fever, uh, chikungunya, and other diseases. And so this has complicated both the clinical assessment uh, and the diagnostic serologic assessment of suspect cases. Well, um, these are the major issues that are being confronted in South America. Uh, microcephaly, uh, this number, this is an old slide from CDC, old being like two weeks ago. Uh, the number now is uh, somewhere around 4,300 cases of microcephaly. There have uh, been some, uh, there's been some speculation about whether there's some element of overdiagnosis. Many of these cases are still under investigation, uh, and so I don't know what the final common number, uh, final number will be, uh, but clearly uh, this is a, a, a major public health crisis as we know. These infants, again by analogy with other congenital infections like CMV, also have chorioretinitis. Here's a, a recent image from uh, JAMA Ophthalmology demonstrating this in one of the congenital Zika patients. And then we've also seen now, I think just around 2,000 cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome um, in Brazil uh, that's also um, um, probably associated with Zika virus infection. Now, one of the issues that's come up is there's quite, quite, quite a lot of variability even in Brazil in the diagnosis of microcephaly. And you can see from this heat map uh, that there are certain regions in Brazil where this is uh, much, much more common than others. And because of this variability and because of the variability in use in different states uh, in uh, certain insecticides, in particular this insecticide, pyroproxifen, uh, there's been um, some rumor and speculation as to whether or not this might be the etiology of microcephaly in some infants. And um, I, I think that uh, there's some scientific basis to believe that something like that could be feasible. Uh, this insecticide has been shown to be teratogenic in certain insect um, models and other small animal models. On the other hand, I think we've come back with some pretty definitive proof now that Zika virus is the cause of microcephaly in um, probably most of these cases. And this is from the New England Journal article that was published uh, now two or three weeks ago. Uh, this was a woman who had been in Brazil, had developed an acute febrile illness with rash at the end of the first trimester of her pregnancy. Ultrasonographic examination at 29 weeks gestation revealed microcephaly with calcification in the fetal brain. Uh, diagnostic evaluation for other torch infections was negative. And then um, at uh, the time of histopathologic gross and, and histopathologic uh, examination uh, of fetal brain, there were several very striking findings. One of these, of course, is the finding of uh, ventriculomegaly with calcifications, as you can see in this image. Uh, note, too, how smooth this brain is. The normal gyri and sulci are absent. So poly, micro, gyria, and lysencephaly. Again, uh, the kinds of brain um, anomalies that we're used to seeing with other infections such as CMV. Very tellingly, electron microscopy, a brain tissue showing envelope virus particles, and then molecular analysis of genome recovered from the fetus showing that this was indeed Zika virus uh, uh, as shown by molecular phylogenetic comparisons, a part of the South American clade that has been um, circulating. And uh, again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, it, it's noteworthy that this is most similar to the Cambodian and French Polynesian strains, as you can see here, and a little more distant from the original uh, African and Ugandan isolates from the 1940s. A follow-up study, another study, uh, published just last week now in uh, Lancet, uh, identified and sequenced Zika virus uh, genome from amniotic fluid in two women who had, once again, the uh, sort of classic primary symptom complex of Zika virus. Uh, and the analysis of the genome in these infants showed, again, the presence of uh, uh, the Brazilian subtype of Zika virus. Uh, and this is just the genome map showing similarity to the Ugandan strain in um, blue and to the Brazilian st strain in green, uh, much, much stronger identity with the South American strain. So I think these kinds of studies have put to rest the issue of the insecticide uh, problem. 
uh, and uh, really have focused our intention, attention now on really pretty compelling causal evidence for uh, congenital transmission and transplacental transmission. I just want to finish up by saying a couple of words about the virology of Zika virus. Uh, this, of course, is a member of the Flavi virus family. Uh, this vi family is a large family uh, of many infections that are, include many vector-borne infections, dengue fever, West Nile, yellow fever. Envelope virus, uh, icosahedral nucleocapsid, and a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome. And this cartoon shows the, the, the outline of the virus. And so as for many envelope viruses, these outer membrane glycoproteins are important correlates of immunity and potential vaccine targets. Uh, this uh, uh, is an interesting virus in that the RNA uh, is a polycystronic message, meaning that it's synthesized into one large polyprotein, which then undergoes um, proteolysis uh, to individual protein subunits. Uh, the five prime region of this RNA is capped, but the three prime end of the RNA lacks a poly A tail. Uh, and of course, wh why do we call them flavy viruses? Flavy um, comes from the word meaning yellow, uh, yellow fever being the prototype. Here's where Zika virus falls in terms of molecular phylogeny with other human pathogenic um, flavy viruses. And so you can see it's reasonably close to dengue fever, uh, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile encephalitis, uh, an emerging infection, infection here in the upper Midwest, a Powassan virus as well, uh, 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 similarly a Flavy virus. The life cycle of the virus involves um, pinocytosis through uh, a, a, a low pH fusion mechanism with the uh, outer envelope of, of the target cell. And so this event, this receptor-mediated endocytosis, modifies, it, it occurs at a low pH and dramatically modifies the conformation of the outer envelope glycoprotein in a mechanism that's very similar to respiratory syncytial virus and, and other well-characterized pathogens. Once in the endosome, the virus can uncoat. Its single-stranded plus sense RNA genome can serve as the template for translation of that initial polyprotein, and it can also serve as the template for a formation of a minus sense strand here, that, which is then the template for more uh, genomic uh, synthesis for progeny virions. This uh, process uh, occurs entirely outside of uh, the nucleus. And so uh, the um, uh, movement then of virions uh, back to the cell surface where they bud uh, depends upon post-translational modification in the endoplasmic reticulum. It does not derive its envelope from the inner nuclear membrane, and that way very different than herpes viruses. Uh, we need to see better information about the conformation of these uh, envelope glycoproteins. This shows how the conformation changes in the presence of low pH. And a paper now several years old from tick-borne encephalitis virus identified both this very striking conformational change in the protein as well as several pathogenesis motifs. You can see here in this three-dimensional model this presence of um, an aspartate residue, which is a part of an RGD motif that may be important in extracellular uh, receptor ligand interactions. It's known from yellow fever that if you mutagenize the RGD motif in the major envelope like a protein, you modify pathogenesis. And as I've alluded to before, the African strains of Zika virus have a deletion that deletes this important uh, um, N-linked glycosylation site uh, in the envelope glycoprotein. So this sets the stage for <coughs> mutagenesis and pathogenesis studies as well as uh, vaccine studies. Uh, what will the vaccine future hold? Um, I'll defer any detailed discussion about this until the end of the talk. I will just point out that we do have a dengue fever vaccine now licensed in several parts of the world, and this vaccine uses a yellow fever backbone, and that may be a solution for Zika virus. So my last slide, just to conclude, I think these are some of the questions I would pose, a lot of the unanswered questions about Zika. How does in utero transmission occur? Is Zika different in this aspect from other Flavy viruses, and how is it different? Uh, we have not seen in utero transmission as a common motif with other Flavy viridae, and when we talk about the Polynesian outbreak in 2013, that was not a feature of that outbreak. Um, so this needs to be understood. Um, does the intercurrent presence of antibody to dengue actually enhance the infectivity of uh, Zika virus? This is pure speculation, but we know from other models of dengue that there are several different serotypes 
And a phenomena of immune enhancement of infection can occur uh, across different serotypes because of the fact that the receptor, um, uh, FC gamma receptor, can actually um, attract virus particles to the potential um, target cell. So I think we need to resolve this issue. Big issue for dengue vaccines. I think it may be an issue for Zika virus. We don't know anything about the pathogenesis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Is this uh, shared epitopes, uh, autoimmunity, molecular mimicry? Uh, and what is indeed targeted in the developing fetal brain that leads to microcephaly and other anomalies? What are the molecular virological correlates of pathogenicity to the placenta? I've already alluded to a couple of different candidate genes that may end up being important as we consider this question. And what would be an ideal vaccine strategy and what kind of animal model could we study this in? Uh, and then uh, uh, my final bullet point, uh, re really an introduction now to Dr. Osterholm's talk, what kind of public health measures, including vector control, might be useful and, and how can we reflect on this emerging epidemic in the context of uh, past uh, similar epidemics? I would point out, too, that we now have over 4,000 cases of brain injury in Brazil due to congenital Zika virus infection. Uh, that's actually about the same number of babies that have permanent neurologic injury in the United States every year from congenital cytomegalovirus infection. Uh, and so uh, my hope is that even as we focus, as we should, on understanding the pathogenicity and prevention of Zika virus infection, that this might give us an opportunity to reflect back and think about other uh, unresolved public health uh, urgent uh, issues in the United States, including congenital CMV. So with that, I will, will stop and um, uh, re return the floor to Dr. Ferrari. Thank you, Mark. That was terrific. We'll hold questions until after Dr. Osterholm's talk. Many of you know him. He is visible on every epidemic that we encounter. As you know, uh, Mike, as everyone calls him, is a Regents Professor. He's the McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health and Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy and is an adjunct professor at the medical school. Mike, thank you. I know how busy you are. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. In here, like, we have help here that, thank on you. this, Thank you. Thanks Mike. very much. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Sorry, I just caught part of Mark's presentation. Thanks. I will try not to duplicate anything you said. It's obviously a very fast-moving area. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yep. So just like that, that's a great picture. <laughs> just go to the Zika Pediatrics. Zika Pediatrics, right there. Okay, right there. Just pull it over. Thanks. I'm going to try to set the table for where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going relative to this event. Um, by way of background, I gave my first talk on Zika infection in the Americas uh, three years ago this month, uh, suggesting that it was just a matter of time before this was going to happen, and it's basically more of it's going to happen soon. Uh, just quickly to give a sense of the world we live in today, which is why we have part of the problem we do. Uh, what used to take us years to circumnavigate the globe, now we do literally overnight, and what that flat part of the red line is is actually the most dynamic part of it because of what goes around the world. World population, now this is 2000, we're at 7.3 billion. The fastest growing areas of the world are the developing country megacities, which if you want to look at why this problem can emerge even faster and farther, it's because of that very issue. In the old days of vector control, it worked very well. Uh, what, what DDT didn't do to your lungs is smoke wood, and uh, you pretty much uh, took care of everything. Uh, people re fail to realize we are at an all-time low in vector control in the Americas in history, in all history. And you say, how do you know that? Well, if you look at the Mosquito Aedes aegypti, just take that as an example. This came over in the first slave ships from Africa. It was never in the Americas. It spread only locally because this is basically what, in a sense, was an abrilio mosquito 5,000 years ago living in the forest canopy, and today it is the Norway rat of mosquitoes. It lives with humans, very quickly adapted to humans. This is a mosquito that basically doesn't fly more than a block or two away from where it's hatched. It lives in temporary bodies of water that we create, which I'll show you. Uh, it's most commonly found location in the house is dark in the closet. It's a daytime biter. Uh, it's a soft biter. You don't feel it bite you. It bites you the back of the neck, the back of the elbows, the back of the knees, and the ankles. It is adapted to that so that you don't even see it. And it has also another very bad habit. It will take five to six blood meals in a day, meaning it will very easily snack as opposed to a big blood meal. And so the potential to transmit to a lot of people are very real. 
Um, if you look in the 1930s, uh, back when we were trying to uh, really deal with this issue and the old great men of public health, uh, that's where his, uh, Aedes aegypti was located. And it also doesn't give you the actual uh, population levels, though. But by the 1970s, this is where it was at. And where it was at was almost in very rarely found, very low levels. This was the work of uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Pan American Health Organization. And it had some help with DDT. Today, if you look in 2015, and this is actually being revised, uh, where today we actually see now that uh, uh, it's moving down into Argentina, and the populations are in some cases anywhere from 500 to 1,000 times higher than they were back in the 1930s. So this is at an all-time high in terms of population. The Aedes albopictus that Mark mentioned is a the Asian tiger mosquito, is another vector potentially, and I say potentially because we surely don't have confirmed data of this, but it is another Aedes mosquito. This was a mosquito that originally was found only in the area of uh, uh, Southeast Asia primarily, uh, and then with the truck tire economy in the 1980s, where it was much cheaper to retread tires in Asia for large trucks and bring them back to the US, we brought back cargo <laughs> after cargo ship full of trucks, tires with the mosquito eggs having been laid in the inside of the tires, and then spread quickly throughout the world. Now, Mark showed this slide where we worry about Aedes aegypti, obviously, is in the southern part of the United States. The levels are much lower than we see in the Americas. Uh, I'll point out in a moment why. But Aedes albopictus surely could become a problem. And I would be very careful to say it's not going to be a problem. This is an example why. We had said for a long time Aedes albopictus was not doing a very good job of moving dengue, so it probably isn't a problem. The outbreak right now in the big island of Hawaii that we have right this very minute is being totally vectored by Aedes albopictus. There's no Aedes aegypti there. And so we do know that it actually can become a competent vector for some of these issues. I'd hate to see it become a competent vector for, for Zika or chikungunya. Now, why are we having a problem today? These are all slides. These are all pictures taken within the last two months. So it gives you a sense of what's happening in the Americas. All that garbage you see right here, solid waste, is really the problem. Uh, and what happened in the 1960s and early 70s was exactly for those of you old enough to remember the movie The Graduate, when everybody saw Dustin Hoffman go into plastics. With the plastic rubber world that is non-biodegradable, we now have a solid waste problem unheard of or unseen at any time in human history. This is what it looks like in the cities, the towns, and even the countrysides of the Americas right now. One bottle cap literally sitting in a ditch with water coming in and out from rainfalls enough to hatch and breed well over 150 to 300 mosquito larvae a week. Just one bottle cap. All of this is garbage that is ideal, ideal breeding site locations. All the plastic you see here. This is, this is the solid waste problem of the developing world. Anybody who's been there knows that. Even in the up, most upscale areas you see it. A city park in one of the most prominent cities in all the Americas. So this is what we're up against. This is what we need to get rid of. This is not a swamp mosquito. This is not a body of water kind of mosquito that you'd think of in rice fields and so forth. Even like we see with West Nile in the United States, where Culex tarsalis, which might breed in the Minnesota River bottoms uh, near south of Shakopee and fly 40 miles in one night. Literally, we've, we've shown that to happen. This is a very different kind of mosquito. If you could clean this up in your neighborhood, you could greatly reduce the risk of any of the Aedes aegypti related mosquito problems. This is, I, I, I look at this picture and I say, this has got to be Aedes aegypti Disneyland right there. <laughs> I mean, it is. It is as good as you can get. So until we deal with this issue, we're not going to really deal with the problem. Adulticiding, where you do spraying, is going to have limited impact. It looks good. Uh, where you, uh, the introduction of genetically modified male mosquitoes may have some impact. We've shown it, but it can't be on a widespread basis. It's really going to be source reduction, which is this. Now, I want to just mention dengue because it really is the model. Right now, there are over 2.5 billion people in the world, two-fifths of the world population at risk from dengue. We estimate that uh, WHO estimated 50 million dengue infections worldwide every year. A recent study from the Global Development Group out at the University of Washington just estimated that it's probably as high as 100 million. Uh, there were at least 1.1 million reported cases in the Americas in 2014, a gross underreporting of what's there. Uh, it's now endemic in more than 100 countries. And we had an explosive outbreak in Brazil in, 2000, in 2013, 205,000 cases, 7,000 deaths. You know, we didn't need Zika to tell us we have a problem. But it's young kids. It's a big picture opportunity. It tugs at our hearts. And that's what really made Zika become the problem it's become. 
If you look at the dengue countries in the world, this is pretty much where you're going to see uh, Zika or chikungunya. Now, if you look at the distribution of dengue virus serotypes, which, as Mark pointed out, through enhancement disease, we now have a new disease called basically hem dengue hemorrhagic fever, where if you're infected with one serotype first, and there are surely orders that, and different types of serotypes that enhance this potential. But this is what it looked like in 1970 in terms of the four strain, uh, different serotypes only in Southeast Asia. Then if you look at what happened by 2014, all four are everywhere. So suddenly dengue hemorrhagic fever evolved overnight, literally, literally in our lifetime, to be a disease that it is today. This is the belt of where dengue hemorrhagic fever was before 1960, where it's afterwards. You're talking about a disease with a case fatality rate of 20 to 30 percent. You're talking about a disease that's not good to get. And ironically, we often get more questions about people who've had dengue going to the Americas and then coming back and saying, can I ever go back again? Well, if you do, just know that if you're at risk of another infection, the next one might not be as easy as the first one was, and the first one wasn't all that easy. Now, we saw chikungunya emerge. This is actually one where, uh, believe it or not, I actually got in big trouble with my family, but actually ended up getting out of trouble. We had vacation plans for March in 2014 in St. Martin, and I canceled it after the December appearance of chikungunya in St. Martin in 2013. And the best thing that ever happened, because quickly chikungunya spread throughout the Americas, uh, we now see it basically in 40 plus countries. Uh, at least 39 states have reported cases of people traveling to these areas and coming back with chikungunya. Uh, the un number of cases is grossly underreported, but even last year, in the second year of the epidemic, there were over a million cases reported. Now, if you look again, where's chikungunya occurring? Basically in the same locations. The United States and Alaska reflect travelers' cases, not uh, the actual occurrence there. Just in the last week, Costa Rica has reported over a 600% increase in dengue and chikungunya, where we actually have better reporting. So this has really become an America's issue. If you look at the disease, it's not a good disease in chikungunya. This is a study from Reunion Island in 2005 to 9, looking at uh, chikungunya and the amount of encephalitis and what occurred there. And we now have multiple reports of long-term disability associated with arthritis and other musculoskeletal problems. Well, at six months, over 40% of people infected are still reporting problems. So it's not a great disease to get, even if it doesn't kill you, although there have been several hundred deaths. So this is the, uh, one of the reasons why I've been talking about chicken, or, uh, Zika coming. This is actually the data from the French Polynesian area, and this is a slide I've had since 2014, in which they marked, markedly noted a big difference in the epidemiology and clinical presentation of Zika virus in French Polynesia, different than we'd seen before, not this benign, just rash, but actually microcephaly and Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we had some evidence at that point of some genetic changes in the virus, uh, that made it a neurotropic virus we had not seen before. So all of us said, hey, it's just a matter of time before chicken, or Zika does what chicken gun you just did. It's going to get here and it's going to spread. So why the hell is everybody surprised? Even PAHO put out on May 7th of last year, well before it got here, a warning to say Zika may be coming. Get ready. But we did nothing in vector control. We did nothing really about it, already a major problem with dengue and chikungunya. Now today we see how this has changed. Uh, to make a long story short, and I could go into much more data on this, we believe clearly that this virus basically did go through some mutational changes, uh, as a, probably in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia from 2007 to 2010, making its way to French Polynesia, which was the really first time we saw the kind of neurotropic disease. And this virus has every potential to go back to Africa and Asia again, meaning the one that was there may not have provided very good cross-protection, and surely a lot of people are not yet uh, been infected. So don't think that this is over with in the Americas. We're really, really on top of what could be a global epidemic of this in the same rain we see dengue. Today, if you look at the transmission here, you can see we have an increasing number of cases that are occurring. Uh, I think we're up to 34 countries today. There have been two new ones added in the last 24 hours. It's just a matter of time before it's throughout this entire area. I give CDC great credit. In January, they uh, noted the microcephaly link. A lot of people who are commenting as microcephaly associated are a bunch of virologists and clinicians, and I say that to you with a smile, who don't, have never worked up an outbreak in their life. They have no idea what the hell they're talking about. When we looked at this issue, we had groups of clinicians in both Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela who all of a sudden went, OBGYNs who have been in practice for many years, who were having two to four cases of microcephaly a month in their practice, 
suddenly going to 25 a day. Now, that tells you something's going on. That's impressive. Same thing with Guillain-Barre syndrome. We had neurologist groups that were seeing three to five Guillain-Barre syndrome cases a year that were now seeing four to five a day. Now, they all were looking for an answer why. They didn't think of Zika at first. And it was only in retrospective analysis that they actually saw that, in fact, well, these people also had a conjunctival hyperemia type illness with a rash, et cetera, and then realized it was Zika. The other part of this is, everybody says, well, but it's not likely to be all of this because we're seeing a lot of GBS in countries where we're not seeing any of the microcephaly. Well, of course, we would have predicted that because this virus right now in Brazil has primarily been in the map, Mark's map up there of the upper uh, Pernambuco area of Brazil. It hasn't hit most of Brazil yet. It's yet to unfold. But where it's hit, GBS proceeds microcephaly by how many? Six months because we probably think most of the uh, damage is occurring in the first trimester. But if you deliver a baby to term, that's six more months away. Where the Guillain-Barre syndrome is occurring 24 to 30 days post-infection, uh, that you'd see the GBS first. So this is kind of an unfolding outbreak, and CDC picked up on this early, and to their real credit, actually came through it. They've been <coughs> listing interim travel guidance for Zika virus. Uh, this paper, which uh, came out on February 10th, as Mark talked about, uh, surely gave very clear and compelling data that this was a direct impact neurologically on these babies. The New England Journal paper. Here's a paper that's coming out uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock in Plos Neglected Tropical Diseases. It's still embargoed until 2, in which actually the group from Yale actually have demonstrated in a case of hydrops fatalis, hydroencephaly, and fetal demise. They've actually isolated the virus from the actual stillbirth, and it's the full virus. Uh, it's a very classic illness, and when you look at the pathology of that brain, it's remarkable. Absolutely, this paper is just, it's, it's stunning to read this. And so when this comes out tomorrow, I think we're going to kind of put to rest. By the way, we have had many, many women now who have had no previous evidence of dengue, no previous evidence of chikungunya, who are Zika positive only, and who are having this. So even the potential for immune enhancement is there, but it's not necessary. I mean, clearly Zika is able to do what it's doing. We continue to see WHO kind of following the lead of CDC two to three weeks later. Uh, they're kind of finally on board now. Their new statement is it's guilty until proven innocent that it's uh, Zika causing this problem, and I think it's really true. Let me just point out, I do want to mention the GBS. I'm going to come back to that just in one moment on vaccine. Uh, this is a paper uh, published uh, uh, in November, but just now to print, actually looking at the NS1 Akundan usage adaption in humans, which actually some of these issues now looking at the viruses from before, I'm absolutely convinced that, in fact, there was a mutational change that occurred with the neurotropism of this virus that we saw from before and when it was basically in Africa and Asia to what we're seeing now. And this is one of the issues that uh, we always have to be aware of in infectious diseases. This is, of course, microcephaly here. One of the challenges, are you going to recommend people not have babies for two years? Let me tell you, in two years, we're not going to have any answers. We will not have a vaccine in two years, and I'll mention that in just a moment. So anybody who says it's a two-year time period is wishful thinking. I mean, this is going to have to be something we're going to confront long term uh, in terms of dealing with this issue. Sexual spread, Mark already mentioned this. We're not surprised. I was a little surprised that we have 14 cases already. Um, and I say 14. These came out yesterday. Uh, of those, four have actually been confirmed. It looks like four more are going to be confirmed today. Uh, I'm not sure all 14 are cases, but all of these were people who actually were infected before the warning went into place. I think now we have much more of a concern, people traveling there. But it's hell for the people living there. You can't suddenly go away from it. And one of the questions is going to be how long is a big debate today. WHO says 28 days post-return. Use a condom if you're a male. CDC leaves it open. I think CDC is right. I think we're going to find some people may actually have this infection much longer than 28 days. And so the transmission can be a real issue. Uh, in terms of this is the 28-day the piece right here, but at least people are on board right now. But this is a tough one in, in uh, the Africa. Clearly, the Pope's visit was timely. His comments on the use of contraceptives is going to be a fundamental game changer. Uh, we're already seeing at least five archbishops who are not going to agree to it. We'll see if the Pope comes and tells them, basically, I'm in charge. Uh, 
Um, and uh, I think clearly this is going to be important uh, as a breakthrough in the Catholic Church, and you know the prominence of the Catholic Church in the Americas in terms of this issue for women trying to avoid pregnancy for the time period. Uh, as far as travelers visiting countries, we're going to see more of this. It surely has become a major challenge. Uh, this issue about travelers, and particularly women, at first was seen as discriminatory, but in public health, what else do you have to offer? I mean, it surely was not meant to be discriminatory, but, you know, the key issue is obviously the microcephaly and to the extent Guillain-Barre syndrome. The blood supply was already mentioned. I won't talk that, Jeff and John, how many times we've been through these <laughs> between the two of I mean, you. We've lived our lives working on, on blood-related issues here. Uh, I think this is going to be a big challenge. We're going to see transfusion-associated cases that have already occurred that we didn't realize were in the works. We'll see some right here in the United States. In fact, I'm aware of two that may be confirmed soon. And then let me just close by saying the mosquito control, don't get swayed by all these fancy shots of people out there spraying all this stuff, et cetera. It really has limited impact. It's really about source reduction. It's about getting rid of that garbage, which ironically you can empower the local population to do but they're waiting for government to do it, and that's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to see a bunch of vaccines coming forward. Already everybody's is reporting their results so far. Let me tell you, I do not think a vaccine is coming anytime soon for two reasons. Number one is the fact that, you know, having, and I'm, I'm biased by this, I was one of the people that helped discover the association with uh, swine flu back in 1976 with Guillain-Barre and the swine flu vaccine. I can tell you, having talked to regulators already, they're nervous as hell about this. If this virus can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, what would tell you the vaccine couldn't or wouldn't? And where for most people this disease is benign, you don't want to be spreading a lot of quote-unquote Guillain-Barre syndrome out there. So the studies to show safety are going to have to be substantial. Hundreds of thousands of people vaccinated, which are not going to be easy to do. So that's number one. Number two is there's not going to be a market for this. Last year in this country, there were 1,500 neuroinvasive cases of West Nile virus infection. Really bad infections. Did anybody hear people calling for a West Nile vaccine? They say, but it wasn't little babies. This is what's happening, what we just had happen with the Ebola vaccine. And I uh, co-chair the Ebola vaccine Team B group with Jeremy Ferrer from the Wellcome Trust, and we're having a terrible problem right now with the Ebola vaccine. Out of sight, out of mind, it's gone away. The companies are all kicking themselves. Why the hell did we invest? 25 to 50 million dollars in Ebola vaccine work and now we're not going to have any market at the end. Zika infection is going to peak in about 18 months in the Americas and then it's going to start to come down because it'll have saturated through the population and then you'll have incident cases every year that'll be there but not the high levels we're seeing now. By the time this vaccine gets to market, Zika is going to just be another disease on the map like dengue was that nobody heard about even though it killed lots of people. And by that time, who's going to pay for this? And I can tell you, we've talked to a number of the companies that are looking at this and say, we're taking a look at it, but we know it's public relations. The only ones serious about this are startups who basically are hoping they'll get a vaccine and then somebody will buy it. And we know what the story of those are often are. So I'm not optimistic we're going to see a very po uh, uh, efficacious vaccine. Let me just conclude by saying, I know this is a self-serving message, but uh, the SIDRAP resource site for uh, Zika is the one that actually been touted even by WHO and the Wellcome Trust and others. It's a one-stop shopping. You can go there. Everything is linked in the world. Every organization, everything. If you want WHO, PAHO, CDC, anything. So I, if you want more information, it's updated daily. This is the site. Let me just conclude by saying how scared should we be about Zika? This was my, uh, my uh, op-ed I had in the New York Times two weeks ago about this issue. And again, what scares us versus what concerns us versus what hurts us versus what kills us are all very different. In the two-year period of Ebola in West Africa, many, 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 many more people died from HIV, TB, vaccine preventable diseases, and diarrheal diseases than ever died from Ebola, and you didn't hear about any of them. Zika is now the disease du jour of the Americas that got everybody's attention, but you didn't even have to go that far because we already had the problems there with dengue, et cetera. And what it really goes back to is, are we going to get serious about vector control? Aedes aegypti is a mosquito that doesn't have to exist. You know, you can talk about Anopheles and malaria and all these kinds of things. If we cleaned up the garbage in our personal living space and the areas around us, Aedes aegypti would go away, just like we almost did in the 1970s. And so that's the challenge, but that's too simple. People want a technological hit. They want some kind of government action to come in and swoop down. And so the message is going to be, 
we can take care of this in a much, much, much more efficient way by ourselves getting involved than just waiting for somebody to come save us, because if we do, it's not going to happen. Thank you very much. entertain questions for Dr. Schleiss and Dr. Uh, Osterholm. We're taping this so that we'll have it available. So, first question, comments. Who's canceled their vacation plans? <laughs> Who hasn't? You haven't. Who lives on the big island? I have a question for Mike. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll just start out. Um, Mike, there's been a call from the president to appropriate, I think, $1.8 billion. 1 1.9, yep. And uh, to my knowledge, Congress hasn't acted on this yet. I wonder right. if you had any more information on that. Well, they have acted on it, but irresponsibly. Um, <laughs> first of all, they got caught in the abortion politics, and right away there was a refusal to move it forward through two committees because they couldn't assure, despite the fact that we assure all the time now our federal funds don't go to abortion related activities, that this would not be used for abortion work in the Americas. You know, how are we going to get Brazil to tell us, you know, sign in a line, we're not going to use this money for abortion. So that, I think we've gotten over. Now they want to go in and cut out the Ebola money. So there still is a lot of work to do in Ebola. And so the Republican Congress said, well, let's just take money from Ebola because the cases aren't occurring right now. Um, and there, let me, just, let me just make a point about Ebola. I just have to say, because this, this is an example of how stupid we are. And we are stupid. And that's not a Donald Trump comment. Um, <laughs> right, now, right, now, right now, we are in a quiet period in Ebola in West Africa. But if you look at the equatorial Africa, and if any of you have been there, and I know we have a group that's all from here has been there. I mean, I was in, in Kinshasa not long ago, where here's a city of 14.5 million people, which 5 million live in the most dire slum conditions you could ever imagine in the world. If West Africa was gas cans waiting for a mass shit with Ebola, Places like Kinshasa are gas tankers waiting. We need this Ebola vaccine really badly because we're going to have more of what happened in West Africa, but potentially in a much worse situation, you know, in Kibera, in Nairobi, et cetera. So one of the things we need to do is convince Congress and others that investing in these, and not when they happen, but before they happen and try to prevent them is what we need to do. We should have had basically these virus vaccines five years ago, ten years ago. We could have and should have. Uh, Jeremy Freer and I just published a paper in Lancet looking at what is the landscape for what we need for vaccines? And so, but Congress will always react only. And we just tend to do that, and that's always too late. It's like buying the fire truck after the 9-11 call comes in. I'm sure people are eager to know the precise incubation period, Mark. Could you address that briefly? Yeah. Well, I, uh, most of what's published out there seems to suggest something in the range of um, 7 to 21 days. I, I think it's rather variable, Pat, and I think the other, the other issue is even after the symptomatic infection is cleared, um, the continued shedding of virus, um, as we commented on with the cases of sexual transmission, I think it leaves something as a, as a rather an open question as well. Other questions? Yes, Mary. So if you get it, do you not develop an antibody so that you become immune to it? You're just going to yeah. be shedding it for a long time and you can be infecting other people and we're never going to have immune people. <laughs> well, I, I think that, that immunity to Zika virus is something that a, a normal, healthy host will generate. Uh, I, I don't know about the duration of shedding. Uh, again, by analogy with something like cytomegalovirus where arguably you never really have, you know, sterilizing immunity over the course of your lifetime, you may shed intermittently for years or, or uh, uh, during periods of acute stress. I, I don't think Zika will be anything like that. Um, but uh, um, I, I think we need to learn a lot more about the exact timing of IgM and IgG responses. That will become quite important in monitoring um, pregnancy. And neither Mike nor I talked about this very much, but there are some guidelines that have come out now about monitoring yeah. women at risk. You know, I think this is one of the things that's an important issue is, you know, we, we, we think we're so smart. You know, I have to tell you, I know less about more things today than I ever did in my lifetime. <laughs> and Ebola vac virus infection is a good example. I mean, we have these people fully recover from Ebola, no clinical signs and symptoms, and then suddenly they do get eye problems. Uh, and we know that this, this, you know, sequestered location in the eye, we know in the testes and semen of men, we now, three weeks ago, confirmed uh, lactation and breast milk positivity in women seven months after they recovered from Ebola. And yet, if you look immunity-wise, they look good. 
Some of you may be aware of the nurse, Tracy Hickok from Scotland, who was infected, came back in uh, seven months later. Well, she was readmitted yesterday in critical condition. And she's now on her one year anniversary of infection and she's back in the hospital today with that same thing. So part of it is we're just only learning now that, you know, what does it mean to be fully recovered from an infection and when do you have sterilized immunity as Mark said and when not? And I think for some of these infections, I agree with him, I don't think we have any evidence in flavoviruses that you have long term uh, kinds of infections, but I think some of these sequestered site issues are going to be really interesting to find out. And unfortunately, the testes and semen happen to be a bad one for women. Dr. Furr? No, I didn't. I thought you had your hand up. No. Uh, Mike, Lyndon, and then Dr. Uh, and, and then Jeff. Yeah, just a brief question. This might also be very, but people always call for a lot of microbiologists asking them for, you know, we think this person has Zika virus. How do we test? I would presume it's acute and convalescent serum, but I yeah. I'd be curious, and what is a good reference that I sent to? Any one of us could answer that. Go ahead. Call the health department. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That is the answer. Yep. No, that is the answer. They have to screen and decide that, yes, you qualify for testing. And so that, I don't wish to be flippant, Mike, but no, that's this perfect. is the best right now. No, we're not going to be developing serological tests nor molecular tests at this time because I think by the time you have it all up and running, the volume will go down and the number of patients who have Zika is going to drop right, down. Right, right. As uh, Mike Osterholm said, 18 months, we'll be talking about a new phenomenon maybe? The other thing I would add would be you always want to talk to whoever your referral source is about nucleic acid-based detection methodologies as well, yeah, yeah. in addition to serologic ass assessment. Probably more important to, to get nucleic acid-based amplification studies. And yeah. testing will become more available uh, over time. CDC is working 28 hours a day right now to get test kits out. And so initially the triage was just that problem getting them out. So this probably anticipated within about six to 12 weeks, it'll be much easier to get testing and there won't be as much screening going on if there's a potential uh, reason why to be tested. And there will be reagents to use in surgical pathology because we know that the New England Journal of Medicine paper had beautiful immunohistochemical stains of brain in these fetuses, Mike. So that is available. That came out of Brazil or Portugal. I'm not sure where they did the immunohistochemical staining, but CDC will have that availability. Dr. McCullough and then uh, Front Mike, I want to ask you about uh, blood safety, one of our favorite topics. Uh, as you know, uh, the CDC's current recommendation just a week or so ago was that when, not if, when the virus hits southern U.S., um, blood banks should stop collecting blood there and ship it in from other parts of the United States, which could be done. It's a logistical nightmare, and it will definitely end up creating some blood shortages. Some patients won't get what they need when they need it. We also presume, uh, for those of you that could never think about this, the nature of a test to screen 15 million units of blood a year in the United States is different yep. from the kind of reagents to do the diagnostic testing you're talking about. So from a blood screening standpoint, we assume it'll be a year to two years before we can screen the blood. So what do you think about this whole situation? I usually just call you. <laughs> I would ask you that question, you and John. I mean, you've been at the forefront of this. I mean, I wish your technology was out there right now to inactivate all these viruses. That's what I really wish. Well, as you know, that could be done. I know. They tried to do it in Puerto Rico for chicken gunya. Uh, and there's a particular FDA uh, approval mechanism where you can uh, put in a new technology. It's called pathogen activation. Uh, the, the catch to it, even though it's not licensed, the catch to it is you have to track every patient. Yeah. And you have to get consent from the patient to give them blood. And most of the physicians in Puerto Rico didn't want to do that. So they ended up with blood that was... Uh, I think you've raised a really good challenge. I mean, for the group that doesn't know this, uh, Jeff's been involved with a really, I think, cutting edge technology that very well could have a major impact on the safety of blood supply by inactivating these, these agents. And I wish, I wish it could be employed. I think what's you're the, right. What's the mechanism of the inactivation? Uh, damage oh, no. nucleic acids, so then any remaining infectious agent can't They can't duplicate. replicate. Can't replicate. It's really it. We all also should be very cautious as phlebotomists because a patient infected with the virus 
can transmit it to you if you have a break in technique. And so this has not been discussed very much. You've seen it in the literature, perhaps, yeah, yeah. Mark and Mike. Yep. And so you don't get scared, but I feel patients with this or suspected should have a sign on the door warning everyone uh, that this is a suspected uh, case of Zika. It takes one airplane to get it here. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah. I have one more question, Dr. Crossan. Well, my question actually is very similar to Mike's and Jeff's. I just wanted to know a little bit more about the technology of testing for Zika. Obviously, it takes us many years to develop a really reliable yeah. test for any of these viruses. And, and how long is it going to take to really get a reliable test? For well, we have reliable tests right now, but they're limited in where they can be done. For example, the health department right now would be sending them to CDC. Yeah, okay. And so yeah, we have real-time PCR, is, is it? Okay. RT-PCR, mm -hmm. and we also have serological tests, and the IgM is considered a fairly good assay, I understand. It is. It's, it, they had to work out the issue of cross-reactivity with the other flavor viruses. I mean, there's a high level of cross-reactivity with, with dengue and chikungunya. Yeah. So, and that, I think, is really proceeding at a very fast pace. But we're always going to be playing catch-up for the next <coughs> months. And I think Jeff's point on the blood bank is a clear and compelling one that it's not that easy just to suddenly go and start testing 15 million units. Uh, it do doesn't happen like that overnight. Well, I want to thank both speakers. Thank it's you. Really wonderful. Thanks.